topics out there that speak to how to kind of juggle all of it. And a lot focused on the workplace in terms of how productive we are, uh, but not enough conversation about how we're actually feeling. And we've put together a really powerful panel today to discuss it a bit and talk about what it feels like and also some ideas and strategies and solutions to help people feel a bit more connected at this time. We desperately need it. My name is Jill Wesley and I work with the Female Quotient and we've curated a really special series and all of these recordings will be made, made available on the Female Quotient uh, website and also on the Facebook and LinkedIn uh, pages. So please check out the other sessions we've done. They've been fabulous. Um, I'm excited to work with everyone today. Uh, my work is all about helping people find their voice and speak their truth and connect with people through communication. So we're going to be checking in with everybody to see based on their own experience, what it's been like right now and what's most important to them. So I'm gonna go around. I'm gonna just start with my screen. I can see um, Marissa first, and I would just love for you to introduce yourself and will you tell us, just take a minute and tell us why this particular topic is important to you. Um, my name is Marisa Munoz. I'm a senior business strategy and operations manager at Verizon Media. Um, I also I happen to be the global lead for um, our ERG named Somos Verizon, which is the voice of the Latinx community. Um, this topic is super important to me um, because I live it and breathe it every day. Um, when you're thinking about community and family and engagement, um, ERGs are a big part of our companies. And so like this, this kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, and Latinos in general, like we're familia. So um, having all those different connections and making sure that we're um, interconnected and that we have, um, we have visibility if somebody needs us, right? So that, that's why this is super important to me. Oh, thank you so much. And I appreciate it. And Marisa, thank you for, I'll remember to pronounce it correctly. Thank you. Barb, tell us a little bit about you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, my name is Barb Rosman. I'm the Chief Talent Officer of Campbell. This is an topic to me because really two reasons, personally and professionally. Yeah, I'm personally, I'm a mom, I'm a full-time working mom of four children, which was... Oops. Froze a little bit. For, uh, Barb, you're frozen for me. I can see that your connection isn't strong. Talent for our company. Um, it, oop, oop, you... We were having a little problem with the signal um, oh, on your sorry. end. So, so I no, it's okay. It it paused right after you said you were a mom of four, and I thought we were just taking a moment of silence for you <laughs> to honor I need it. what you have Thank on your plate. You. Thank you. Yeah. So that 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 is challenging, right? Um, and then. You know, I was saying the, the other reason it's important is professionally, right? Yeah. My role as talent leader for our company, I think um, my mantras, one of my mantras has always been that, you know, if something's important to someone at my company, it should imp be important to me and to our leadership. It doesn't matter what that is. And, um, you know, COVID and all of the things going on in the world, racial unrest, political challenges, environmental challenges has brought us to the brink, so many people to the brink of struggle and um, enduring things that we never thought we would be enduring before. Um, any one of those, let alone all of those at one time. And so I think that as a talent leader, um, it's just really important to me that we create, like you said, Marisa, uh, an environment where people feel they can bring to work who they are, they can talk about who they are, um, and therefore hopefully get the support and community. It's not perfect, but get that support and community from one another that we need now more than ever. The one good I think I will say about COVID, if there are a few, is that we are, I know it's very cliche, but we are all experiencing some level of challenge together. And so I do think that has allowed more room for people to, people who probably didn't talk about it as much before, to talk about their struggles and challenges Okay, I am going to, um, I'll come back to Barb because I want to make sure we can keep things moving. And um, I'm going to move to you, Abby, if it's okay. And then we'll try and pick up Barb a little bit later um, once, once her connection is stronger. Sure. 
Hi, thank you for having me. Uh -huh. um, this is my wheelhouse, it's what I do. I'm a psychologist and I'm a relationship maven. Like all I do are all things relationships. So for me, this is um, a time when, you know, everyone already had a full plate mm -hmm. and now we've added to that plate and it is spilling over. And so we've talked a lot about flattening the curve when it comes to physical health, but now we know that we have to flatten the curve for mental health. I am busting. I am. Um, I was. I had a client at six o'clock this morning because I feel like people are desperate. They're having so much trouble, and you know, I'm a frontline worker in that way, uh, and really need to be where people are. So there's a you know a lot of good tools, and we're going to talk about those today. It, it's it's certainly not. Uh, there's a lot of hope. It's just that, that folks have to really understand that this. I keep hearing how fatigued people are and how tired. And I'm like, of course you are. It's pandemic uh, fatigue or Corona burnout, whatever you want to call that. But our brains, our bandwidth is, was already so full and adding this, it's, it doesn't matter. The uncertainty in our brains, I won't get too into it, but you know, the way our brains work, uncertainty is the worst thing possible. It means danger to our brains. And that's all we've had. And so people are spilling over the edge of that and, need really good tools and real strategies they can use. So I'm excited to be here today. Wonderful. Thank you. Kara. Hi, my name is Kara Larix and I'm an LGBTQ matchmaker and date coach with Three Day Rule. I love what I do. I have the pure pleasure of connecting men, women, non-binary folks, trans folks, coast to coast, day in and day out. And I feel very lucky because the company that I work for, our primary goal is connection. So I feel like we've done a really good job within our company, supporting each other and staying connected during this. And I'd love to share how we've done that. But in addition, I've talked with hundreds of singles over the past six months, and I've been on the ride with all of them. And I've heard more tips and tricks than I know what to do with in terms of battling loneliness, isolation, and really still maintain that hopeful feeling for connection. So thrilled to share my client stories, thrilled to share anything I can to help because there's no doubt that this has been tough. So thrilled to be here, can't wait to share. Oh, I appreciate it. Yes, all of you are bringing so many different layers to the conversation. And you know, we're talking about a sense of community and that can be with the, the colleagues we have at work and also the sense of connection and isolation, not just with our colleagues at work, but what it feels like at home. And I, I joked before we kick things off where, oh my goodness, some of us, we think, oh, if we could just be alone. I remember I took a, a couple of months ago, I took a call. I, I, was, I couldn't find any space to be alone because they'll find me. And I was outside, like on the side of my house, like near the bushes on a call. <laughs> and I realized, okay, I, I know not everyone is having this experience. And some people are still inside of a home full of people and feeling isolated and disconnected. So I, I wanted to do this particular session and curated it because my philosophy around leadership has always been, I may be having a, a specific experience or I may be in a room full of people who isn't in this room or who isn't having the experience I'm having because I bet we need to talk about it. So there's just so much conversation around you know, juggling and being on all the time, but I'm also thinking about employees who are living alone mm -hmm. and don't have family near them and are, are struggling with that too. So if that, anyone who's watching, if that's your experience, I wanna acknowledge that because it's the opposite of mine and I know that it has its own challenges. So today we'll speak around some, some things that can be um, incorporated into our routine or our, our policies to, to help people feel like they, they belong and remind them that, that they're cared for. So I would love to talk um, about maybe some of your own experiences. Let's do that first. Mm -hmm. How have you navigated this period, um, which it's six months, but feels like it's 60 years long? Um, how, that's just me, right? Am I, are you with me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I have six different moods every day. You know, I'm like, this is, I have an idea, we'll do this. And then other days I'm like, everybody leave me alone. So tell me how, Marisa, how have you navigated this um, personally and professionally? What has it been like for you? 
Well, honestly, I can completely relate to what you just said about being alone, right? I live alone. Um, I, um, I have a huge community of colleagues and coworkers and family. However, my personal circumstances, I am on my own. And so it took me a minute um, to regroup um, with the COVID, you know, you get the message, like, I think ours, you know, March 13th, I remember that date, it's like, okay, you're not coming back to the office. And you don't know when and if you're ever going to go back. But had I known, I would have just done all these other things, but I didn't get that opportunity. And so it took me about, I'd say, a month or so to really recalibrate myself and understand that, like, um, something is off. Um, because as we were talking right before we joined, I'm, an, you know, an introverted extrovert. So like I, I relish my quiet time, but I also need community. And so um, I, I was around April or so that I finally realized that I was off a little bit. And um, in grad school, I studied under Professor Jeremy Hunter. Um, I, I went to business school. So we did a lot of the practice of mindfulness and from a, from a business perspective, um, meeting East meets West, East meets West basically. And um, I started going back to that because he had, he offered a free session. I went online, like, this is what I needed. And then it just kind of escalated from there. Mm -hmm. And so then I re I recognize within myself that I'm like, I'm off from like a fight or flight perspective. Like I need to mm -hmm. center myself and reground and basically reteach myself the things that I had learned way back when, so that I could be better and more able and present for my community, because I do represent, you know, Verizon Media, our um, ERG, they needed me at that time, right? And so like, I needed to be able to take a step back, take care of myself, and then be there for them every single day. Um, and so we, the way we leverage that is I was able to take some time for me. I started doing um, a lot of different mindfulness practices again. Um, I took, there's an offering that we had at work um, with the Thrive app. So I started doing these micro steps of like cutting, one of the biggest things was, especially in social and civil unrest with the George Floyd murder, um, I was completely caught up in media all the time. And I work in media, so it's very hard to cut that off. And so I started just doing very small things of like, okay, today, um, from this day forward, I'm cutting off all news and social media at 9 p.m. And then I just started moving that up and up until I felt that I was um, more balanced. And then for my community internally, we started having, um, our, our work was having these safe space conversations but then I wanted to have my own with my own community. So we still do those every week. Um, sometimes, you know, it's on a Thursday, other times it's on a Friday, we alternate and then people can come and join in and just say, hey, how are you feeling? Como están? You know, we're Latino. So like, how are you feeling? What's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? Um, and then I recognize that I still have to take that time to cut off again um, so that I can re-energize and recharge um, and then do it again the next day. And then from a personal perspective, um, I also took steps and like literally contacting my family and setting up like social distance visits initially because we weren't sure. Mm -hmm. And so then as you start moving along the months, your like circle kind of expands and you're meeting the same people. So that makes it all easier to like kind of navigate. So like I have like a two week thing. I'm like, okay, I haven't seen somebody in two weeks. I need to go hang out with my family or with mm -hmm. a friend or somebody that is in my circle. Oh, that's such great. Thank you for everything that you shared, because if, if you're on your own and I've lived alone at different, different chapters in my life, um, it's reminding yourself that, okay, I'm going to make, make the extra effort and, and reach out to some folks. And, um, even if social distanced connection is still some connection and, and I love that. Thank you so much, Manisa. I appreciate it. Abby, I'm thinking about the, the work you do and you being a relationship uh, expert and therapist, and how are you, what are you seeing, number one, for couples? And number two, how, how are you able to kind of, um, people really need you right now? So how are you able to take care of yourself when I imagine business is, has okay. gone up for, for couples? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a pandemic-proof profession. If anything, I, I, it sounds I'm busier than ever. So, I, bet. I, um, bet. I my speaking engagements aren't the same, but uh, my private is much bigger. And so, um, and I will say this: you know, I got sick. I had COVID. So back in April, and so and didn't have anything serious. And but I was out for about six weeks, solid. <clears throat> with a very low grade fever and it was crazy. And, but wow. you know, you do, so I really had to 
um, get with it and what do I have to do? But one thing happened, I'd say like, I felt very, it, you know, it really doesn't kill most people. And, you know, you get out of that fear about it a little bit. It's like, oh, it's been here. I dealt with it. I'm dealing with it. But I did have to really take care of myself, obviously, on the other side, because I couldn't go back full time for a while. I had to really ease in. And it's really, for me, I deepened my spiritual practice, like by tenfold. And I have been just, you know, to me, I'm the I'm the lighthouse, right? That is why folks are coming. So I make sure that I have lots of light and I am doing all the self-care things I need to do to as a priority to be able to do that. And I really am looking at like, there's some, I'm in my office right now. My office is only a mile from my home. I'm very lucky. And, but I love the quiet. I, I like how quiet it is outside. I like that I can kind of leave my office messy because I don't have, as long as it's not messy behind me, uh, people don't really, right? There's like a relaxedness to it also. And I already did a lot of Zoom because I have international clients and clients in other time zones. But um, I think for me, uh, it's really, I'm in, uh, I'm a recovering heroin addict. And so, and I'm from New York City and I live in the Bay Area. So I've been going to these 12 step meetings back in New York <laughs> all the time that I used to go to coming up. And I love it. I'm years ago. Yeah, I haven't seen in ago. 20 years. And so I, you know, I try to remind people all the time that it's social distancing is not, it's physical distancing. It is not social distancing. Um, and so, and every time we use that word, we keep you know, doing that. So I do want to, I keep reminding people it is just physical distance. There's a lot of ways to still have a lot of social connection and the couples that I'm seeing and the individuals who are just miserable and their, you know, their home lives are feeling uh, overwhelming on whatever level that is. I'm really, the first things first is that it's very easy when you're around someone all the time to complain, to just notice, like, I can't believe he, Shoes ice with his mouth open. Oh my God, I'm, we, we need a divorce. Clearly we need a divorce <laughs> or, you know, you. That is grounds. I'm just saying. Right, but, It's grounds. Go you know, you took the knife through the peanut butter first and then into the jelly. We're done. You know, it's just <laughs> been, people are just so done. And so, but what happens is then they're like, you're doing this and I'm doing, you know, and there's uh, all this tension around trying to, you know, cure whatever is going on. And I tell people all the time, you have to connect to correct. So the one thing I can say to everyone listening is don't correct unless there's a connection first. So don't tell them what they're doing wrong. Don't, you know, give suggestions or advice or any of that or criticize. Really think about how do I connect with this person? You know, where is the lean in? And to be the lighthouse, you know, to be what you want to see. If you want to see more appreciation, be really appreciative. If you know, if you want to have more love, be more loving. It's about really leaning in to the things you want and not focusing on the things you don't. And it's, so it's going towards something, not away from something. And that is needed more than ever right now in our work also and our right everywhere is, to, but to keep, and the thing is you've got to stay ahead of it. I, and so people often feel crappy all day and then try to not feel crappy at like five o'clock and end up with, you know, a pint of haagen or a bottle of booze or Netflix all night because you, you, it's your, a car is coming down a steep hill and you're trying to stop it at the bottom. It, mm. You can't do that. You, you're going to get flattened. So you need, you know, momentum is a serious thing. It's the same car at the top and at the bottom, but it's a lot easier to stop, stop at the top. So I'm really working with people about getting ahead of it, starting your day religiously, sacredly with this time for yourself, with this time that's just rejuvenating. Pray, meditate, be mindful, re watch a funny cat video, whatever it is for you that really helps you feel connected to yourself, to, mm. to the world, to the universe, you know, whatever that is that grounds you, do that first and get ahead of it. So it's not trying to stop negative things, thoughts. It's trying to keep positive thoughts rolling more. And, that, and having that attitude is a, is a game changer. Thank you. Oh, wow. So many things to consider and that, that it's physical distance not versus social distance and, and the takeaway around, you know, are you, it's a lot easier to stop that. <laughs> stop that car when it's up on top of the hill, because I do know 
most, most employees, whether they're leaders, frontline, everybody's pushing, 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 pushing. And I feel like so many people are just going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And without, without taking those pit stops throughout the day, um, and even if it is five minutes, uh, to, to take care of themselves and just check in to see how they're doing. Um, yeah. Barb, you're back. I would love to, to get, um, are you might be on mute. Let's double check. Oh, you're not. Okay. I'm not sure if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yay. You're back. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I, my phone. I don't know what happened. Sorry about no that. No worries. No worries. Well, let me get a question with you just in case we have some, some challenges We're my question to you is what do you see organizationally, what are some things that can be done to, to create a sense of community and connection within companies? What are, what are some things that have worked? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think it's been interesting, at least in our experience, is that that's changed as we've gone through the last six months in particular, because the needs of people have changed. You know, we started out, um, I think most people started out thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of a short term, or we're hopeful that this is going to be a short term solution. And so people were kind of trying to engage in what I'll call more fun activities, you know, the group happy hour or the group oh, yeah. fun social kind of things. And those are important, don't get me wrong. But um, I do think that we've seen a trend towards um, definitely more focus on the need for flexibility, the need for at work and hours and how you're going to work your schedule. And let's have conversations with your leadership about what do you need because of your personal circumstances around flexibility um, and trying to define that for each person. We, we started talking about, is there a way we can, you know, try to organize flexibility for everyone to give them options, but because people's situations are so unique. What we really found was it has to be organized flexibility that works for each individual, right? Mm -hmm. their, their situation has to work. The other thing I think that we found um, as it's morphed and changed is that what people um, are needing more is yes, community, but also time. Um, mm. And so that means time for lots of different things, whether it's taking care of others, you know, people in your life, um, your children, your mental health, like you were just talking about, Abby, like the things that you might need to do during the day to walk away and take a walk or find time to do, we do online like exercise classes to get yoga classes together, right? So people are still connecting and doing yoga together, but virtually mm -hmm. within the work day. Um, and we've also tried to, when, when it feels like there's enough people that, <laughs> um, which is not a good thing, you know, maybe are at the breaking point of I've just been working too hard and I need that break. Um, trying to encourage people to, you know, we, we've cl closed down a few times for some mental health holidays and said, we're going right. to close the company for the day. Um, wow. Because one thing we found is that we have, we're unique, I guess, in that we have um, what we call unlimited, we call it METO, but which is paid time off, right? <laughs> so pe people taking time off wasn't an issue, but people really felt like, I guilty about taking time off or why should I take it off? I'm just sitting in my house anyway. Um, and so it, we felt like it became more important to give those kind of holidays and breaks where people could unplug and not feel that guilt that people were collectively doing it together. So I think that organizationally, it's really important to, I guess, stay attuned to through talking to your people and providing those opportunities to find out what their needs are as we go through this, the winter months, I'm sure will present a whole new, another level of needs. And so um, just think we have to be willing to evolve um, and support our employees where they are because um, it's changing. That's right. And really important points you're making because we have gone through these different stages uh, in terms of employee needs. And it did kick off with let's, you know, we're all at home and let, you know, it was kind of before the wave hit and the subsequent waves and reminding organizations and leaders that the individual needs are important. Number two, that they need to be flexible and continue to evolve and reminding people to get ahead of what's next. Absolutely. If we're thinking about winter and, um, you know, flu season, the, the weather, what, what it's going to be like, you know, parts of the country that get dark, really, you know, depression, there's a lot that's up ahead. Um, so for, 
for leaders to really be as uh, anticipatory as possible around all of this, I think is, is a really great point. Thank you, Barb. Yep. Kara, I'd love to talk with you um, because I'm thinking about, you know, you're an expert in the, in the dating scene and I wanted specifically, I wanted you on this panel because there's your expertise in the dating scene and specifically working with LGBTQ um, singles. When I think of, you know, people in the workplace maybe feeling isolated or disconnected, I think about how often, how rare those conversations uh, are happening around what it what it may be like. What are you seeing? I would love to just get a sense of um, what you're seeing in the the dating world in general, and then anything you're you you could speak to for the LGBTQ uh, folks that are tuning in. Absolutely, what a treat. And I feel like I've taken a little piece from something everybody has said that is like, yeah. yes, this is my, my reality too, and this fits in exactly to what I'm experiencing. You know, it's um, dating is a different landscape. And within our company, I remember back in March, April, just kind of a panic thinking, this is what we do. We connect people in person. We bring together people to meet in person uh, for dates, what are we gonna do? And it's been fascinating to just lean in to what has happened and to really understand our company needs to change, daters need to change, singles are having a different experience. And so the overall theme for me has been meet people where they are at today. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, we go through a million different emotions in one day and I find it's the same. You know, I meet with each one of my clients or potential matches for about an hour each. And I really start every single meeting with, how are you? How are things in your neck of the woods? You know, to really take the temperature of where somebody is at right there in that moment to kind of guide and see how our conversation is going to go and to do my best to meet them where they're at. And specifically for LGBTQ individuals who just in normal times don't always have an opportunity to talk about their wants and desires and fears and you know wishes for the future in this time it's even more important to offer that space for people just to talk about where they are right in the moment no expectations for the future you know no one knows what's going to happen the frustrations of the past it's just i feel so grateful and honored to have the opportunity to give people space to talk right now and, you know, I think that's LGBTQ or not, I think that that's one of the most important things we can do is meet people right where they're at and then offer the time and space to let it go. You know, go ahead, whatever is okay. Wherever you're at, it's just fine because guess what, I've probably been there too. Let's talk about it and let's just kind of get it out of the way so that we can move on then to achieving whatever goals you have in relationships, love, dating, all that good stuff. Oh, that's such a great, you know, what's interesting because you're talking about, Carrie, you're talking about creating a space for people to have a real conversation. Um, I, I think of all my international friends who first moved to the States and when, you know, they'd be at the store or they'd be out and about and somebody would say, how, hi, how are you? And then they would tell them and I'd go, no, 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 in the United States, <laughs> that, that, that quick kind of, hi, how are you at the, at the grocery store? Move it along, buddy. They're not, it's a, it's just a way of greeting. It's not a real, how are you? But that's where we have to make time and space to talk about how we're doing. I'm curious though, you reminded me of something I think that's really important, whether it's in the dating world for those who are living on their own or, or are not in a relationship, but it, I think it, it also applies to the workspace is how real, how uh, do we have permission to be real? I'm thinking about Kara, maybe you can give me a quick answer around how are people dating when they're trying to put their best foot forward and they don't want to sound like, oh, you know, I, I wore sweatpants for three days straight and ate mashed potatoes. Yeah. That's very specific because maybe that's what I did, but I'm just saying, so I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about like, I feel like at work and at home, people are trying to keep it all together and keep up a bit of a facade. What are you seeing? Yeah, well, I love that um, if ever there was a time to be authentic, it's now. You know, conversations don't start with, where should we get a drink? But yeah. really, how are you? How is your family? 
And so connections are coming in at a deeper level a lot quicker. And we don't really have any choice but to be authentic at this point because we all are sharing this common trauma right now. Right. And so I'm finding in, in the dating world, it's, it's a real plus. People you know, are making these deeper connections much quicker than they had in the past. Um, you know, along with that, there's all kinds of challenges. You were talking about time earlier and, you know, some folks have no work. Some folks have more work than they know what to do with. And then in terms of dating or meetings or happy hours or whatever it is, some can't wait to get there and to interact. Others are like, please, if I have to be on Zoom for five more minutes, I'm going to, you know, so it's just, again, meeting people where they're at. And, and that's true in terms of being authentic with dating too. You can go ahead and joke about your sweatpants if you want to, you know, but expect that from the person on the other side of the screen too, you know? So it's just being very real and right where we are. That's right. And, and being right where we are and seeing that it's not an, it's it's not a universal experience. Yes, we're, we're dealing with the pandemic and multiple challenges, but it's not hitting everybody the same way. One of the things that I, what struck me about the concept of isolation is, I mean, being a black woman, my own experience around the George Floyd murder and the, you know, all kinds of murder and, and unrest where like whether someone's family is being hit by COVID or someone's family is being hit by um, a job loss or their, their children can't go away to school now. Like, I feel like there's a collective sense of grief that people are experiencing in multiple ways. And I'm, I'm curious, Barb, what I understand the, the benefits, et cetera. How have you as a leader, how have you been navigating some of that with um, team members and employees that are, they, they may not have the same challenge with uh, having a house full of people and mul all those multiple responsibilities. What are you seeing? Yeah. That, um, those are all really good questions and it is so different for every person. And it's also interesting. We have offices in three locations across the country and even regionally, you know, what people are experiencing based oh. on things. So, um, you know, I think what we've tried to do and organizations are trying to do are find those moments, hopefully that are authentic, that can bring folks together to sometimes, like you talked about, grieve together even with your coworkers, or we've you know had listening. We had when George Floyd happened, we had a couple of different listening sessions immediately, kind of following with employees just to talk about how are you exactly the question you asked, Kara, and how are you coping? Tell us about your situation. And we came to the the sessions not with an agenda, not with a presentation, but just literally to give people that space and time. Um, and, you know, we had people at all levels sharing really raw, real stories, um, crying together, really. And, and in that way, it did bring, I think, a better sense of community with people because you're, again, I think you're sharing more. If you're given the right platform and the right safe space, you're sharing things that you may not have talked about so openly in an organization before because we are all in this situation together. I know many of our um, employees of color have felt in the past, and I hope they don't feel it now, but have felt in the past that like these kind of, you know, things that happened with George Floyd would go on before and no one would talk about them at work. The next right. Day, right? Um, and, you know, their feeling of isolation even more so because of that, because they were facing it alone and had to act like nothing was happening. And the, the, Again, some silver lining in this is that there is a sense of reckoning might be too strong of a word, but reckoning that people have to now come together and, and we all have to talk about these things together because that's the only way we kind of move forward. We can't act like none of this is happening. It's going to affect who we are as individuals, our work, our environment. So it's so important to provide that space. And we talk to our leaders even all the time. They're generally great about this, about you need to exhibit that behavior. You need to yeah. normalize these kind of conversations and talk about, you know, even if you're the CEO or the, you know, most junior employee in the company, um, we all have things we're dealing with. So by you as that leader talking about 
that thing, you know, you're struggling with your children and what they're going to do, or your, you know, great aunt just passed away of COVID or whatever, um, bringing that to the table, not because you may not want to share it with everyone, but as a leader, you have a little bit more responsibility to make people know that you're human and that we're all experiencing these truths together so that others can hopefully feel comfortable to do the same. Oh, so important. Thank you for that. And that modeling piece is, you know, there seems to be a chasm between what the leaders are experiencing and what employees are. And for a leader to model that behavior and, and demonstrate some vulnerability and that a lot of us are making things up as we go along. Thank you for that, Barb. One of the things that I often hear uh, when it comes to any type of difficult conversation, whether it has to do with, with grief or how are things going, or so, we know that maybe a team member or someone in our lives is struggling. What I hear often is, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I don't want to make a mistake. And I'm curious. I'd love to hear because, you know, help helping people get connected is what you do for a living, Abby. What, what are some ways that, that people, whether it's with a, a colleague or it's, it's with a relationship at home, do you have some suggestions on, on entry points and how to kind of, because sometimes it feels like it's a cold start for people mm-hmm. and then we don't talk about something until it's really big. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's actually easy. And, and because, well, simple, sorry, not easy, okay. simple. Uh, what you want to do and what we always want to do anyway is connect through the emotion, not the content. Mm. So everybody wants to talk about the thing and I think this and you think that. And instead, if I'm speaking to someone and I really, uh, one of my friends who's black and I really can't say that I understand I, I don't, I'm, I'm white woman. I, I don't understand what's that, right? And so we're, we're close and what do I say? How do I do this? And so I say how I feel. I say the truth. I'm, you know, sometimes it's that I feel uncomfortable that I don't know the right thing to say and I love you and I'm watching you in pain and it sucks and I, I, I don't know where to go. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, it could be something else that you do know about and you could say, yeah, I, it's so hard to see you hurting. You know, I'm, or I really, it feel, I can feel your anger. I can feel your, is that what you're experiencing? You know, are you feeling angry? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling depressed? And just, it's the immediate connector. It's the content. It's when we go in our brains that he said, she said, I'm not saying the right thing. And now I'm nervous. And I, I say this a lot. People hear what you don't hear what you say. They hear what you mean. Mm-hmm. So when you are speaking from an inauthentic place, people pick up on that and they feel uncomfortable, right? So if I don't mention that I'm uncomfortable, that I don't really understand, if I don't say it, they're picking up on it and thinking, what's with Abby? Right. Like, I don't, she, I'm not getting her. But if I'm right. just right there with my own humility, my own, you know, I'm, <laughs> I screw up <laughs> my own stuff, People are very forgiving and loving around that. They want to come towards you. And how can, let, let me tell you how to talk to me about this. Uh-huh. Let me tell you what would really help. Let me tell, but when you come in the other way, there's no room. Agree. Right? So, I, so it's emotion first. Emotion time. time. And it's really, it's a great thing to remember, especially because, I mean, we see the data. Women are being hit by, if you think about any, any woman in the workplace right now, the time deficit, the responsibilities, the you know emotional labor of calculating whether they ha- they have parents they they're helping to take care of or manage their care or children or siblings or so mm. you know the being able to speak to co- challenging situations is really important. How have you seen Marisa for um, the? the ERG group, let's talk about that. What, what ways do, based on these conversations, do you have any other suggestions of ways that everyone can um, do a better job supporting one another and any other ideas maybe if there are around what companies may be able to do? I definitely think that there's a lot of opportunity, right? Like we are in a space where um, we unfortunately have this challenge of COVID and, on, and layered on top of it, we have you know, the murder of George Floyd, racial, racial, social unrest, police brutality, 
my community and the black community have been, you know, highly impacted by police brutality. Um, one of the things that I'm always looking at is, you know, thinking of frontline workers, you know, for our, for our employees, if you think about just people in general, 16% of the Latino workforce are able to work from home. That means that there's 84% of us that are out there literally picking the food that people can eat. They're working in uh, grocery stores, so there's delivery services industry. So I always look at life through that lens because that's the lens that I came from. You know, I came from, you know, a working class family on the first person in my family to go to college. And so I always want to put myself in everybody else's shoes and ensure that they feel seen and heard. And so um, the way I do that um, for myself and for my community is, you know, we have, you know, diversity and inclusion as a whole. Um, I'm always the person that speaks on behalf of intersectionality of race and gender, because that affects me a very, at a very deep and profound way. Um, I ensure, I check in with my colleagues. So there's people that I, you know, amongst our ERGs, like when all of these things were going, I'm, I'm the person that'll be like, hey, how are you doing? You know, I don't expect anything or little simple things like we use Slack internally, like a simple little happy face or a heart, I'm thinking of you, do you need anything? Um, you know, from a, from a planning and resource perspective, looking at ways to connect. So like that, that mention of that safe space conversation that we have weekly, that's happening across all of our ERGs. It's also happening at the business level, right? So we have a racial justice committee. We all work together to figure out how we're going to solve, you know, what's happening in society and the contributions that we each make to that. And so having said all that, I think sometimes it's very simple. Hey, I see you. Um, like that was not okay. Like if something happens and unfortunately, sometimes you know, I think people, we get so caught up in like these zoom meetings and all these different things that we forget that, um, some people like me are on our own. Right. So you don't do that check in that. How are you? So I think that's what makes me more, um, like aware of that. And so I'm always constantly, you know, checking in with people, especially if I haven't heard from them in a while or like team members, like some of our leads, um, if there's an opportunity for us to connect if I see a connection of people like, hey, you should talk to so-and-so. Um, another mm -hmm. example that we did um, with, my, with our communities, um, I, again, speaking to intersectionality, race and gender, um, July was um, Black Indigenous People of Color Mental Health Awareness Month. And so a group of us got together and it was kind of cross ERG collaboration of building programming to ensure that the, the different things that were happening within our communities of color were also seen and heard because we are different, definitely impacted in different manners. If you think about access to like medical health care, language barriers to entry, um, undocumented, you know, all of these different things are, are affecting our communities very directly. And so um, I try to bring all that. So when you're talking about like being authentic, like my words, I'm like, I'm radically authentic. I will, I will do whatever I can to be myself and to ensure that I, everyone feels seen and heard wherever they're at. And to your point, I will meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that means not you know, not getting an answer from that heart or that smile that I send forth, but just say, hey, I'm still here when you need me, if you want to check in. Um, and if you want to have a one on one, like I've had so many one on one conversations with people that I've never met before. Um, mm. because I am so outspoken, people have reached out and just say, hey, I want to connect with you. Um, and, and I love it. Like, I'm here for it. You know, I'm like, how do I help you? Um, how do I make you feel that you can be your best self and your best authentic self every single day, you know, and, and not feel that just because we're, you know, like speaking to Kara and like the dating scene, like literally we're letting people into our homes every <laughs> single day. <laughs> so like there is no room, like you feel exposed 24 seven. And so like even giving, like, I'm going to say this out loud, even giving people the chance and the opportunity to feel okay to turn off their camera mm -hmm. and, and be, you know, just use their voice it's okay. Like you have to meet them where they're at and not make it a requirement for people to feel that you have to be constantly seen because that's not always necessary. Um, we need to protect ourselves and our energy as well. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Lots of, lots of applause and nods from everybody on the uh, panel. So we just have a couple more minutes before the panel is up. And I want to take a moment just to acknowledge all of you and thank you for being so um, honest and helpful and I think we're all basically saying, you know, we can, we, we have to do this together. Like there's, there's no way to, <laughs> to get through any of this on our own. I'd love to leave if I could just go around the panel and get one recommendation uh, or tip, that, quick tip that you would give someone who is feeling a sense of disconnect or isolation right now that wants to, wants to feel connected and seen again. 
Um, and we can go in any order. What, um, who, would, who would like to start? We could do it that way. If you can have one tip that you would leave someone right now who's thinking, oh, I just feel alone. I'll start. Um, I, would, I would say, uh, I'll say two things kind of together. Um, for me, it's about perspective. Right, so put this all into perspective for yourself and give yourself a break because of that. Like we, no one is pre has been prepared for this. And when you look at what you have accomplished instead of, or what you've been able to endure or where you are, um, rather than where you aren't or all the things that we tend to do, I think as women, but worry about what we're not doing. Um, it, give yourself that permission and that perspective to say like, I am okay. Um, the other really quick thing is I, I am not great at it, but I started something as silly as a, I call it a joy journal. And I'm just writing down literally two words or one thing a day that I found joy in. And just by doing that one thing, sometimes it makes me recognize what more of that I can do or to appreciate those things because otherwise without it, you do get very overwhelmed. So, so do those things. So true. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Abby, do you have a quick tip for us? Am I ever quick? I don't I'll try. So I would say uh, to whatever you're, when you're noticing a thought, which hopefully you're noticing them more and more, choose the next best feeling thought. So don't try to be all positive. Like, you know, if you're feeling, I am so lonely and I feel so disconnected, don't go like, oh, the world is great. And it, you know, that doesn't work because you're lying to yourself. Mm. This is the next thing you could believe. Well, I'm alone, but you know, I um, I could call my mom, or I do have. I think of one friend I could think of who. So I guess I'm not completely alone. It doesn't make you feel amazing, but it gets you that one step, and then it's that momentum again. And then from there, you can have a next best feeling thought and a next best feeling thought. But don't try to do the whole positive thinking, jumping all the way. It doesn't work because it's not authentic. Wow, that's powerful. Next best. Feeling. Next best feeling thought. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Kara, what would you leave us with? A quick tip for anybody who could use one. This is going to be a silly one, but I'm telling you it, it's um, big returns on little action. So pick something that you like to do or that makes you feel good. So for example, like if I like to do a face mask or something like that, then order one for a friend, have it sent to their house, and then text, you know, be on the lookout, something's coming. And so then you have the time, the fun anticipation for waiting for it to be delivered. And then when it actually gets there, then you get to do something together. Then right. you get to connect afterwards about how great it felt. And you just draw out this lovely, fun experience right now from a little teeny tiny thing. And yeah, it just brings joy, happiness, fun, you know, and it can be anything. Especially I love it. Yeah, super fun. Oh my goodness. That's so it's it's not silly. It's great. I'm looking at the comments. I'm seeing oh. that that oh. Simone said such a great idea. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll do the next panel with face masks on. Please. I'm in. I'm in. Yes. <laughs> and um, to wrap things up, Marisa, what would you suggest anybody do? Uh, somebody do if they they're feeling if they would like to feel a bit more connected. I think that it just depends on your, you know, again, I'm always about to meet people where they're at. If you are someone that um, is feeling, you know, like my situation, I'm alone. So I try and reach out to my family um, and try to make some time with them. Social yeah. distancing are great. Um, internally for work on the professional front, um, I we're especially right now during Latinx Heritage Month, we're doing a lot of planning of events. And so we're trying to find opportunities and moments where we can kind of connect globally um, because we're a global company. So really just trying to find, you know, ways to connect with familia because I call them familia and then invite our friends, you know, right. Invite our neighbors from other ERGs to come and participate and be a part of our community, especially during this time. And um, I also think it's important on a personal front. I do. Um, I've been doing this project that's um, it's almost like a gratitude journal, but it's a gratitude project where um, I make I made 100 handmade things and I gave them away. And then I'm now on the next 100 because I crochet and I make cards. And so that's something that I could do to give back. And it's always something that's unexpected. So if somebody, if I make something and somebody will randomly say like, oh, I like that. And then like, if they're the first person, I make different roles, I make my own. And then sometimes I'll message them. I'm like, what's your address? And then I'll send it to them. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't expect this. So I think there's just like really, like really cool and unique ways that you can kind of use your own superpower, whatever that may be. And like, and then put that out to the world and kind of pay it forward. 
Oh my goodness. What wonderful suggestions from all of you and important experiences and wisdom. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And um, for everyone who's listening, we're thinking of you and we wish everyone the best. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.